Uh, hello, hello. Is this the cafeteria where I order my laws? Oh, go, go, yeah, put him on. Yes, I'd like to order some laws. Well, I, yeah, I know you usually deliver them all in one package, but I don't have much of that appetite today, so can I just order a few? Well, I got the list in the book, and, and I'll, I don't know what looks good to you. The obligation to engage in a trade or profession. That, I, yeah, I'll take that. Yes, yes. What do you think go good with that? <laughs> Cleanliness, of course, of course, put a lot of that on there. <laughs> Chastity. I don't know, and I, I never tried it. Well, 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 suppose you put a little of that on the side. No, 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 no. I pass on the golden rule. No. Yeah, I know you've been serving it a long time. I understand it was Moses' favorite. No, I had some of that back in Christianity, and I could hardly keep it down. <laughs> Obligatory prayer. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Three sides? Oh, three sizes. Oh, three... <laughs> Small, medium, and large. <laughs> well, which one's the most effective? <laughs> oh, well, then I'll take the small. <laughs> no, 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 that'll about fill me up. You just send that up right, send that down right away, will you, please? And then if this works out, I'll order some more tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, wh what is it that makes Americans want to choose that way? And there are some historic reasons, I think that maybe it would help if we understood the way our brethren think about obedience to law. You see, this country was formed in disobedience. We didn't like the laws under which we were forced to live. We did not like to obey those things which were distasteful to us, and so we told the country from which we sprung, we won't do that. And furthermore, when we make up our own government, we're going to make sure it doesn't make us do things we don't want to do. We're going to keep control over that government, and we are not going to do any more those things that we don't understand or we don't like. And we're going to limit our government, and we're going to tell them forever, we distrust you. Now, Firuz mentioned the other, uh, last night, night before, that uh, we put on our currency, in God we trust. Uh, that may be true. But we don't trust other people's interpretation of what God wants us to do. So we have tended to divorce ourselves uh, from trust in God's laws and trust in the existence of the creative essence. So it is a country of skepticism. It does not like, in the main, authority. It suspects it, it resists it, and whenever possible, it lets that authority 
know by disobedience that it does not like the direction that has been taken. The Furious the other night also mentioned that he would like to talk about liberty and obedience to the laws of God. One thing I think that, uh, that uh, Americans may not understand in general is that there is a direct and complete connection between two li true liberty and obedience. Now, we know that because Baha'u'llah has told us the secret, that true liberty consists in obedience to my command. But that's kind of hard to swallow unless you get a picture of what it means. Now, uh, let me try to have you help me paint a picture that will describe the connection between liberty and obedience. Imagine that extending out as far as the eye can see is a vast and fertile plain. Verdant, luxurious, beautiful. On the other side of which is the paradise of eternal reunion. And that's where we want to go. And on this plain that extends in between there is every good thing for the education and the development of our soul, everything, and for our happiness along the way. It looks marvelous, but hidden in the grass of this plain are the venomous vipers of vice. the mind's explosive, the caustic pits of self and passion, the luring, luscious, but lethal fruit of attachment to material pursuits. And we've got to cross that plane to get to the paradise of eternal reunion. And we're free. We can go. But one of us, one of us, has been given a guidebook and a map. And in this book there are chapters on the identification of poisonous things. There are maps designating the location and the dimensions of every pit and every minefield. There are descriptions of the fruits that are edible and those that are poisonous. And there are directions of where to turn and how to climb and the ultimate destination. Now my question to you is, to those who feel that obedience is restrictive, it might seem that you don't want to obey that map. You don't want to look at the chapters that tell you how to go. But friends, who of those travelers together is more free? The one who has no directions? or the one who possesses the map. That's why obedience in trust of the map maker makes you free. Because you can breeze right through the highways and byways. When you feel the rising tide around your feet of the sea of despair, you can turn to the ocean of his mercy. And when the path gets thorny, you can read that it's expected to be thorny. That there are hills to climb and mountains to conquer and things to be done and folks to be rescued along the way. We have 
the map. And the map makes us free. Now, the Baha'i concept of obedience is, is not a difficult one to verbalize because it is an absolute injunction. Obey my laws, obey them all. Obey them instantly. Obey them exactly. But it's a lot harder to do than it is to verbalize. Because no matter where you are or how you are, no matter how I feel about my desire to be instant and exact in my obedience, I still have the cafeteria complex. There are some that I'll get to later. Isn't that right? I'll work on the easy ones. And I'll get to the ones that are a little harder later on. Well, you can't more than open the most holy book until you get to the injunction on obedience. You know, of course, that opening up, Baha'u'llah says, the first duty prescribed by God for his servants is the recognition of him who is the dayspring of his revelation, etc. And then we would like to say, and second, but he doesn't say, and second. He says, whoso achieveth this duty has attained all good, and then he says, it behooveth everyone who reacheth this most sublime station, this summit of transcendent glory, to observe every ordinance of him who is the desire of the world. These twin duties are inseparable. So he doesn't say they're one, two. He says they're twin and inseparable. Twin and inseparable. What this does in terms of religion is something revolutionary because you don't see this too often. Religions are normally of one or two kinds or present or absent. There are those who have, hold, who have held the theological doctrine that to recognize and to accept is to have achieved. And there are those who have said, doesn't matter what you believe, it's what you do that counts. I mean, you do the right thing, and you don't have to believe in God. Well, Hawala lays that to rest right away. He says, you aren't going to get there. You don't have the map unless you put these duties together. Recognition and obedience. Recognition and obedience. Or if you want to, obedience and recognition. But they got to march together. We'll look in a moment at why. Obedience is related to the spiritual value of meeting and overcoming tests. We all know that there is no growth in this dominion without test. No pain, no gain is the way they put it in athletic and aerobic circles, about which you can tell I know very little. <laughs> but I know the vernacular. <laughs> so that the tests of the Almighty, as has been remarked here earlier, are the cause of our growth and progress. And God provides to us a complete set of perfect 
responses to test. And we get to choose whether we're going to apply them or not apply them. One of the things I think that bothers Americans is that they don't like to obey things they don't understand. And if it's obscure, then it does not require, it does not merit obedience. Baha'u'llah, on the other hand, says, Obey my commands as an assistance to yourself. Meaning, you may not know why we prescribe this for you, but do it and grow thereby. Every parent, I'm sure, has had the experience, and certainly you've had the experience as a child, of testing limits. You want to see how far you can go before you're caught up short. I think it's a normal human reaction, particularly uh, in the young. And limits set by parents are recognized as elements of love. That's why the testing. Do you love me? If you loved me, you wouldn't let me burn myself. You wouldn't let me get run over on the freeway. You would not let the bad things happen to me. Therefore, I'll see how much you love me. I will take to the limits and see where you stop. Well, Baha'u'llah has provided us with our own limit testing. He has assured us that if we love him, his love embraces us. And if we love him, we will obey his commands. And we won't get hurt. Now that's reason enough, right? If a parent whom you trust and who always has been right says don't do that, and you love the parent and you trust the parent, you are saved by obedience, even though you don't understand at the beginning the command. Well, for instance, how, how many two-year-olds will readily understand without touching the stove what hot stoves do? Not many. A lot of them will find out by actually, actual experimentation. God willing, most of them will trust their parents and not have to find out through experimentation. Why should we be different with God's commands? Why should we have to prove to ourselves that it hurts if we break them? Why should we, of all people, who have the complete map and guidebook, choose to wander around to see if we can find where the snakes and the mines and the poisonous fruit are? It does not make sense. One of the things that the revelation of Baha'u'llah makes clear is to what and to whom obedience is owed. Another thing that is often confusing in general American life is we don't know who to obey and who not to. We get conflicting signals all the time. The federal law says this, the state law says that. What do you do? The policeman says you ought to be doing this or I'll give you a ticket, and you know he's wrong. What do you do? There are all sorts of times when we've, we are tempted to choose the venue for our obedience. Not so in the Baha'i faith, because obedience is regularized. It is systematized. And we know that we obe owe obedience to the divine command as it is expressed through the covenant of Baha'u'llah and thus through Abdu'l-Baha 
through Shoghi Effendi, through the Universal House of Justice, through our Baha'i institutions, and yes, to those in authority who are not Baha'i institutions. All of those are clearly and explicitly entitled by divine command to our obedience as a protection to us. Consider the alternative and the pitiful examples of divided authority that have infected previous religious dispensations. Islam and Christianity, just to take two that are most obvious. Where are the authorities that must be obeyed? What are the injunctions that create a common ethic among the followers of those religions? You know, the Parliament of the World's Religions, which just completed, was struggling mightily on the subject of a global ethic, something that applies to everybody. Now, if you have a society where everyone makes up what is ethical and practical and pro proper for himself or herself, guess what the common denominator ethic is going to be? It's going to be mush. There's not going to be any basic ethic other than just pablum, other than just idle uh, vocalizing of some kind of, of, of whimsy. Not so, you see, with the faith of Baha'u'llah, because the lines of authority are clearly drawn, the exhortations are complete, they are exact, they are life-saving. One thing I would like to mention in connection with tests is the advantage we have as Baha'is. You know, in industry, the practice generally is to test things to their failure. Now, it sort of makes sense. If, if you're flying in an airplane, it's kind of nice to know that the wings of that airplane in its prototype were tested to the maximum of their strength. That is, somebody tested those things until they fell off so that they would not put that much pressure on them in the air and have them fall off with you on the plane. I like that. Now, human being sometimes gets tested to failure, too. But Baha'u'llah tells us that if we get tested to failure, it's our own fault. Because we have been given the capacity to pass those tests. And I also get this distinct impression from my understanding that if you get tested to failure once, you'll get tested again on that same subject. Well, if you're a teacher and you give a test to your class and somebody gets a hundred that person wasn't tested you don't know what the limits of that person was so no wonder we come pretty close to failure before we understand the nature of growth produced by test no wonder that God's mercy is so complete however that Baha'u'llah says obedience may preserve us from the failure of tests. There are things that we should just do. And by doing, not have to be tested on them. Isn't that nice? Uh, I suppose it's possible to, for someone to go out and who had never been in the water to go out and pass their life-saving examination and that would be wonderful you didn't have to go through all that work and training and effort to to uh, to get the certificate and you end up just as qualified and just as able as anybody who did 
Well, Baha'u'llah in the spiritual realm gives us this option by obedience. That is, to avoid some of the hard knocks and tests, simply by learning to obey automatically. Now, that doesn't sit too well with the American psyche, this automatic obedience that's, that's required. And this, this is why there will be some trouble with your American brethren until they immerse themselves in this revelation and see and feel and understand its wisdom. One of the great things about habitual obedience is like most habits, it's transferable. If you learn to do something in a routine fashion, it makes, you, makes it easier for you to do other things in a routine fashion. I think maybe that's why uh, the central figures of the faith were relatively easy on people who found it difficult to obey all of the laws automatically. You know, uh, Shoghi Effendi himself, in many of his passages, alludes to the fact that we ought not to make it too hard on people who come into the faith and insist on their immediate observation of all the laws. But rather we should introduce them to the spirit that impels this obedience so that they themselves may see the beauty and the wonder and the majesty of, of obedience. So it isn't expected of us that we come perfectly to obedience but rather that we learn well obedience in areas which are transfer, transferable to obedience to other areas. Certain laws we find pleasant, and they're easy to obey. Once obedience to them becomes automatic and routine, we find more of the laws of Baha'u'llah are becoming pleasant and easier and easier to obey. Let me make a suggestion because I think it's critical. I think we can find a place to start. There is one injunction given by each of the central figures, reiterated by the House of Justice over and over again, cited as one of our chief shortcomings in terms of a lack of response, and that is the injunction to teach the faith. We understand the injunction. We have heard it pronounced in, in any thousand number of ways, and yet our response has been not automatic. Now, I'm sure it's not because we don't like it, because anybody who's ever had the experience of teaching the faith knows it's delightful. There is no experience in the world that can compare with the first opening of the eyelids of recognition when you tell somebody about Baha'u'llah. It has made a connection with the infinite for that person and for you. And yet, it's, a pl it's pleasant, it's an injunction, and yet we don't do it too well. I would suggest that this is a good place that we here collectively start the automatic transferability of obedience, that we use the opportunities that will come to us to teach this faith. Benefit you learn. Nobody ever learns so much about a subject as when you have to teach it to somebody. And nobody ever discovers how deficient you are in knowledge until you've tried to impart it uh, to somebody else. And there's nothing we can do about that except start and see. Take a step. Don't worry about deficient performance. We already know enough about deficient performance so that anything we do is preferable 
to, to the status uh, quo in, in this respect. Remember, please, that obedience to this command draws with it infinite assistance. You can't do it by yourself. The minute you start it, the concourse on high rushes to your aid. And Baha'u'llah himself brings his assistance to your efforts. An old man going a lone highway came at the evening, cold and gray, to a chasm, vast and deep and wide, through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The raging flood held no fears for him. But he stopped when he reached the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, scoffed a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting time in building here. You crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build you this bridge at even time? The old man lifted his graying head. <clears throat> Good friend, on the path that I have come, he said, there follows after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This gulf which has been as naught to me, to his young feet may a pitfall be. He too <clears throat> must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. Well, folks, on that vast plain that we have described, the bridges are all built. Baha'u'llah has established every byway, every bridge, every junction, every signpost. But no one will find them without the map. Give them the map.